Hello there everyone and welcome to a webinar organised by the City of London and the British Institute of International and Comparative Law or BICL. In particular it's Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law. My name is Michael Abiodun Ulatokun and I am the Head of Public and Youth Engagement at the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law. As a bit of housekeeping, we can neither see nor hear you, but we are very keen to interact. And as such, we've set up a special platform, Poll Everywhere, that was sent in the initial and last invitation to this webinar. If you would like to sign in now, you can tell us where in the world you're coming from. And we're already starting to see quite a lot of interest from the Americas, India and East Africa, which is really interesting to us. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Catherine McGuinness, who is a leading member of the City of London Corporation, where she is currently the chair of the Policy and Resources Committee. She has re represented Castle Baynard, which is a council ward of the City of London, not to be confused with Barnard Castle, which is a very different infamous market town in County Durham which elsewhere we have discussed as having implications for the rule of law. In addition to these roles, she is a trustee of the Centre for London. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Michael. I'll be very brief because I know we've got a great discussion ahead. And for those wondering what on earth the policy chair is, <clears throat> I'm the political leader of the city. Of I'm effectively, I'm the equivalent of a borough leader for one of the other London boroughs. So look, the rule of law, uh, I mean, it's a vital important to everyone. It's the basis for the administration of justice in this country, for UK legal services provided internationally, and actually for all the financial and professional services which the city and the UK more widely provides, an area we particularly work closely with. It's so important that one of my colleagues, a former Lord Mayor here, used to list the fundamental strengths of and the UK, and he would start his, his number of fundamental strengths would grow, I think, each time he, he gave this speech, but he would start by saying fundamental strengths were rule of law, rule of law, rule of law, and then he would move on. So I think we can really say that it is the bedrock of our standing uh, uh, in the world and our standing uh, with much of the reputation that we ha have. We, in our role as a uh, supporter and promoter of uh, UK financial and professional services, are very keen to ensure that the importance of the rule of law is, is fully recognised. And we're really pleased to support the Bingham Centre in its work. The explosion in online and digital services has of course, given rise to all sorts of opportunities, cutting edge opportunities. And it's been why our economy, much of our economy, not all of it, has been able to thrive despite the pandemic, people moving very seamlessly to working remotely, engaging in this way that we're doing um, at the moment, uh, instead of all being in the office, where actually I am back uh, today. But with those many opportunities and uh, all the advantages it brings, it also gives rise to new challenges uh, to, people, to people's rights. Now we at the City of, uh, the City of London, uh, we have a major educational role, including a leading chain of um, academies and a number of other schools. And I very much hope actually that some of our students may be watching this today. So we are really conscious that besides the opportunity that this brings to uh, young people, the threat to young people, we all lead our lives increasingly online, is something that we need to be looking at. It's a matter which could be of So. I look forward to this discussion. I look hearing. I look forward to hearing what you all have to say. Back to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. And I think it's very important that we have a working definition of the rule of law for this conversation. So I'd like to briefly outline what many believe to be the absolute seminal statement of what the rule of law actually meant, which was provided by Lord Bingham, who was one of the founding patrons of the Bingham Centre and whose death, um, the 10 year anniversary of his death was uh, last week, a uh, moment for reflection, I think, on where the rule of law has gone in the year since. And in his really important contribution, this excellent book, Lord Bingham laid out eight principles. The first, that the law should be clear, 
the second that we should have equality before the law the third that decision makers should act in accordance with their powers before the law and the fourth that it is law and not discretion that should decide people's entitlements as the whim of the king sitting on his high castle is evidently going to bend in the wind and not be on the basis of detailed and scrupulous rules. His fifth aspect was that there should be access to justice so that the letter of the law is more than merely its writing, that it has some substance behind it and where individuals are not given their rights and entitlements, they can actually do something about it, which I know is something that Shay is going to address in her presentation later on. His sixth aspect was that there should be respect for fundamental human rights. The seventh, that there should be fair trials, be that deciding whether or not someone owes you money or deciding whether or not someone has committed a criminal offence. And the eighth principle, that there should be respect for international law. Now, you might argue, and indeed many more intelligent than me have, that the world that Lord Bingham was proclaiming in that statement is rapidly disappearing. Lord Bingham, for example, didn't really operate in a time where the default assumption about a new case would be that it would be held over a conference. Lord knows what he would have thought of the advocates we hear about from America who appeared on calls from their beds still in their night clothes. And he certainly would have had quite a lot to say if he ever heard a minister saying that a particular provision that was being argued might break international law in a specific and limited way. And it is a very strange time for the incorporation of technology into the way that uh, systems of law and politics operate. Look at what we've seen across 2020. Government departments who have decided to decide examination grades by algorithm. Over the, across the pond in the States, we've seen criminal sentences, either wholly or partially, created by algorithms with little judge-made input. And again, in this country, tens of thousands of EU citizens having their residence determined by a semi-automated process. And in taking all of that into account, there are some really key ethical considerations that I think are important for safeguarding democracy and the rule of law as tech eventualism sets in. That is, should we be subject to decisions that are made wholly or mostly on the basis of algorithmic decision making? Does decision by machine eliminate biases? If, it's, if that is true for some algorithms, should we select those and not the ones which may be cheaper on the market? Does the brute force processing capability of the modern computer expose us to a privacy deficit? Is that deficit too great to bear? And what price do we pay in civil liberties in order for our society to advance through technology? These were some of the core questions which were involved as the High Court in August and September of last year and the Court of Appeal in the summer of this year determined the case of Bridges and South Wales Police, said to be the first of its kind to consider the lawfulness of the use of facial recognition software technology by police. In that first challenge in, in summer of last year, the police force's action was said to be lawful on the basis that there was a sufficient legal framework by which their actions could be determined and justified. However, the recent decision of the Court of Appeal over the summer found that we have not really decided who should be the subject of facial recognition software and where it should be done sufficiently that our rights can be safeguarded and justified in law. As such, there was held to be a breach of the claimant, Mr. Edward Bridges' human rights. Now, facial recognition, I think, is a really interesting little pastiche looking at one specific issue that brings in all of these ethical and tech considerations. And probably one of the people who knows the most about this topic in the UK, Arik, who's just got up out of his chair, <laughs> has written a really important report 
that delves deep into these issues whilst also holding a magnifying glass to some of the deep systemic inequalities in our criminal justice system. So Arik, would you like to address our attendees for five minutes on unmasking facial recognition and your major concerns and recommendations for this technology? Yes, thank you for having me. Sorry I disappeared and someone's just banging on my door which is really annoying. But um, yes, as, uh, as Michael said, you know, this is Technology in general, I just want to start actually just a bit, bit more of an introduction about my work and what, where I'm coming from in this, in this discussion. So I run something called WebRoots Democracy, which is focused on um, progressive and inclusive technology policy. And I come at this as a, as a big believer in technology. You know, technology has a lot of positive potential. Um, there are children born today who would not exist had it not been for the creation of the internet. Um, for many people, uh, the internet is considered a fourth utility, right? Like water, gas, energy. It is very difficult to live life now without the internet. So it's such an important part of society. Um, and as a, as a policy area, it's fascinating because there's such a void of clear principles and ideas about um, ensuring that technology serves us and that we're not exploited in, in the manner as, as described uh, earlier. And there, there are common themes across technology, right? So facial recognition is one area I've looked at. Other areas include things like uh, regulating the social media platforms, combating deep fakes, looking at the potential of online voting. And what all of these areas have in common are uh, questions over transparency, questions over legitimacy, questions over usefulness, you know, should we have uh, facial recognition in society? That's what our, this report that Michael mentioned, Unmasking Facial Recognition, uh, looked at this question about whether we should even have facial recognition uh, used by the police, never mind how accurate it is, or, or never mind the, the uh, ins and outs of how the technology works. Um, and because, because of the cross-border nature of the internet, it's very regulating it or enforcing any kind of you know, rule of law or any other concepts we have in uh, the offline world is very difficult to enforce. And the only um, analogy I can, I can think of for the internet is the air that we breathe, right? It's everywhere, we all affect it. It, it doesn't respect borders and it can cause great damage to our society. And it's a really interesting example of uh, looking at how we can regulate something like that uh, with the internet. And although it's a new phenomenon, we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel because there are concepts such as uh, taxation, you know, the rule of law, actually looking at how we can enforce the rule of law on these technologies uh, that don't require, you know, especially new innovations. The issue here is the, the ideology that surrounds this debate. And the reason why WebRoots is focused on progressive policy is because most of the policy that shaped this space over the past 10, 15 years has been led by those in Silicon Valley, uh, in California, in America, which has much stricter views on things like free speech and is much more in favor of uh, you know, the unregulated free market. And there's a really good um, document I would recommend that you read called The Declaration for the Independence of Cyberspace, which was written by um, a person called John Perry Barlow. And in that, it was written in the 90s, and he talks about, uh, it's like a, a, a manifesto for the internet, essentially. And what it says is a message to governments to leave us alone. And this is our new space, and that we uh, run this world now, right? And that, I think, is at the heart of a lot of the issues we're discussing today of which facial recognition, online harms, all of these different issues are a part of. Uh, but specifically on facial recognition, um, our report looked at the racial bias implications of this technology. Uh, so technology never is, uh, you know, it's not a neutral thing. You know, it's shaped by the people who create it and it's shaped by the society within, within which it's deployed. And the debate on facial recognition technology, again, uh, in the past few years has been focused not on that broader question of whether we should even have it, 
but whether we should, um, but what's the way to perfect it, right? So on the racial bias argument uh, with facial recognition technology, the mainstream debate is whether it works on different uh, complexions, different skin colors effectively. And if it doesn't, then it's biased and we shouldn't use it. But what our report was looking at is um, assuming that it will become accurate, because I think it will in, in, in the future, if not already, um, would it still have implications for uh, different minority groups, uh, people of colour, black and brown people in the UK if used by policing? And when you situate the technology within the history of surveillance, which has a very racialized history, going back to uh, the slave times in America where uh, slaves were made to carry lanterns and ID documents, they went out by themselves so they could be easily identified going back to the uh, transatlant transatlantic slave ships, which the uh, British Empire trialed lots of things like uh, fingerprinting. Uh, going back to more recent times, uh, post 9-11, the PREVENT program, the uh, surveillance of uh, Muslim communities in the UK with just CCTV. And looking at that context, would facial recognition have racial bias implications? And our report argues that even if it's accurate, it still would, given what we know in uh, society and given what we know about uh, institutional racism within the criminal justice system. And it also found that uh, one specific finding was that the Metropolitan Police in London uh, didn't bother to actually undertake an equality impact assessment before trialing their te uh, the technology across the capital, which again was one of the issues in the Bridges case was, you know, was did they take the equality uh, impact assessment uh, you know, seriously. If you look at the Welsh, uh, the South Wales Police um, assessment, it's very, you know, it's a very tick box uh, style of a quality impact assessment. It doesn't really get into any of the deeper, deeper issues. And, and if we bring this much closer to today, when we're in this context of, you know, renewed interest in Black Lives Matter, that issue is primarily about the over-policing of black and brown communities, right, in America, in the UK and elsewhere as well as all of the other issues of uh, racism in society. And one very quick thing we should be doing in the UK is having a debate over facial recognition technology, because this, this will be another tool to uh, over-police these communities. And I guess I'll leave it there and we can discuss it further in the questions. Thank you very much, Sharik. And those issues that you discuss in relation to the disproportionate um, inaccuracy of facial recognition software in relation to the black community and and Muslim women I thought are, are quite important for consideration of what it means to be policed equally before the law and again these are areas of work where both Weber Roots Democracy and the Bingham Centre will be publishing further publications in the future um, I'll be writing something in the next few weeks and Eric's excellent report will be shared in the notes. So looking a little bit beyond the activities of the state in this area, I, I also sought to have a little think about what it means to be a social media user, a citizen of the internet in, in current times. This is a context where we are generating, as I've seen written elsewhere, more data than ever before as a result of having to work from home, as a result of having many of the social interactions that we have take place on the internet rather than physically in person. And as such, the amount of information that, is, that we are creating is proliferating at an existent, uh, exponential rate. And I wanted to cast our minds back a couple of years to look at situations where us creating data en masse has enabled corporations to psychographically profile, that is, create incredibly influential and compelling messages that drive our activity, especially in the online arena. The words Cambridge Analytica have, have come to represent, in essence, a sort of metaphor for this activity. And that's certainly one of the high profile instances where our activity online has been captured in order for private companies to better understand us. However, in this instance, many might view this to be quite inimical as the use was to 
create compelling messages that would influence people and really push their buttons with regard to political contests, contests, the biggest of which the elections in America, and it has been connected to several other contests, including the European Union referendum. The company involved was able to create these psychographic profiles by mining users' Facebook social media data, looking at their preferences, their likes, in order to determine how they would respond to political advertisements. Dr. David Stilwell, a few years ago, did a comparative study looking at the ability of your spouse, your mother, your friends to judge how you do on a psychographic test and then had a, an algorithmic process do a similar sort of thing and found that in almost all instances the algorithm was better at judging the person's performance on the psychographic test than all but their spouse which gave us the infamous headlines at the time Facebook knows you better than your mother as such, these tools should be treated with tremendous caution. And one of the key academics in this area, Paul Bernal of the University of East Anglia, has advised people to not engage with any of this. Don't click on a like button on a product service page. Don't do the very convenient thing that I did to join the Zoom call and no doubt several of us will already have done today where you use your Google or Facebook profile in order to log into something as that will then be used by all of those who buy, purchase and use and process the data from these companies in order to psychographically profile. I very much encourage people to read a recent publication by Paul Bernal that that uh, our next speaker has uh, very much considered and will be speaking to in her presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the microphone to Dr. Holly Powell Jones, who is the founder and chief executive of Online Media Law, a consultancy from which she provides a really useful suite of activities, including training on many of these uh, issues of subject matter of today's talk. So Holly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And yeah, I would absolutely echo that um, and say if you want to buy Paul Bernal's book on internet privacy, what do we know and what should we do? It's really, really great. It's only a tenner, very small, very concise and bright pink as well. So I'd definitely get yourself a copy of that if you'd like to find out more about these kinds of issues. Um, I actually watched The Social Dilemma this morning. I don't know whether, I saw a few nods. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great little documentary that's just landed on Netflix, one of the most popular ones at the moment, but that's well worth a look as well if you're interested in learning about the ways in which social media um, can interfere with some of our uh, democratic rights and, and kind of works uh, on two levels, both how it influences and affects individuals, but also on a broad kind of uh, scale as well with lots of us. Um, so my background is uh, I'm a sociologist. I um, did a PhD investigating young people's perceptions of risk, crime, law and policing on social media. And uh, spoiler alert, the findings of my PhD could probably be summarized as people don't really know what is and isn't a crime on social media. People don't really know what their rights are um, or their responsibilities in terms of the law. Um, and I think there's sort of two sides to this debate that we really need to think about. And the first of all, we've got the the awareness of the technology, the tech awareness. So what can the technology do? How does it work? All those kinds of things on a very technical level. But then there's also awareness of human rights. What are your legal rights? Um, and how does the law uh, apply to these kinds of new forms of communication? Because what's really important to remember is that 
we are not just consumers of online media. We are not just data objects. You know, we are also producers and we are active subjects, you know, and active citizens as well. And as has already been mentioned, the, there are ways that the technology can influence and impact us and our social lives, but there's also ways in which how humans behave can influence what kind of a platform, uh, what a platform looks like as well. And I think particularly with regard to uh, online abuse and harassment, which I know is something Shay is an expert in and we'll be talking about in a minute, that's really, really important to consider as well. And um, so my uh, focus, if you like, for this little segment is just to talk more about individual citizens' use of social media and technology. So stepping away from looking at the platforms for a moment and looking at individual users. Um, you all have, uh, as you should hopefully know, a human right to freedom of expression. And um, freedom of expression has two uh, very important uh, distinct parts in the Human Rights Act. The first part are your rights and freedoms, but the second part are your duties and responsibilities. So those are, if you like, the justifications, the lawful justifications for restrictions on your free speech. And what I do is I basically go around to schools uh, and I do university lectures and I mostly teach about the vast uh, numbers of laws that we have governing speech online uh, and expression and I'm just going to do a quick whistle stop tour of some of the things that are criminal offences online which you may or may not know about um, for this little section here. So um, we talk a lot about you know maybe you don't know there are that many laws online. I actually uh, found with my research there were lots of young people who thought that maybe the internet was a bit of a wild west space where there weren't any laws, there's no governance, there's no regulation um, and actually we do have quite a few things that are criminal offences um, at least in England and Wales and the UK um, that uh, apply to social media. So Things like threats, making threats, uh, threats to kill, harassment, so that's causing people alarm and distress, stalking, coercive and controlling behaviour if it's digitally enabled, inciting violence, um, uh, publishing material that stirs up racial or religious hatred, um, things like grossly offensive, indecent, uh, obscene or false communications. Um, we've also got things like um, making or possessing indecent images of children. Um, we've got disclosing private or kind of sexual uh, video material, photographs, um, sometimes called revenge porn. Uh, and of course, quite recently, you might have seen um, you know, the, the campaign by Gina Martin that was successful to get so-called upskirting made a criminal offence as well. Um, so we do have a lot of other things. Um, I've got done here glorifying and encouraging terrorism, also a crime, encouraging suicide, um, and a whole host of things that I think broadly fall under contempt of court as well. So that's where you have to be really careful not to publish or broadcast um, material that will uh, cause, if you like, uh, interference with the course of justice. So um, you might have seen me on my social networks um, slapping the wrist of Nigel Farage this week because he was asking why police officers weren't naming this person who'd committed this crime. And I had to sort of explain, well, actually, we've got very strict laws to protect your right to a fair trial that you can't just go around saying somebody's guilty before they've been found guilty in a court of law. We've also got very important things like anonymity provisions for children who are involved in crime and criminal cases uh, and sex sexual offence victims. Sex victims are also given certain legal uh, right to anonymity, um, which is something that a lot of people don't know about and people get into trouble uh, every year with the police uh, or prosecuted for many of these things that they do not know are illegal. Now, I'm not saying the law is perfect. I think there's lots of room for development. Um, and you can actually go and have a look right now at the Law Commission, which is undertaking a review of all the laws uh, that apply to social media. So online abuse, um, image-based abuse and communications offences at this very point in time, it's open for consultation. So um, this is something we are constantly seeking feedback into. Um, and I think it's really, really important. Um, again, the rule of law has to start with that uh, legality, that awareness of the law. It's got to be 
clear and accessible. I'm not sure it is that clear and accessible yet. We perhaps need to work on it a lot more. Um, but I am quite nervous about the concept of outsourcing uh, the policing and the upholding of the law, law enforcement, to social media platforms or to certain public bodies or groups that um, you know maybe will be uh, leaning more towards that kind of that discretionary um, uh, rules rather than uh, using law as a, as a point for underpinning everything that we do online so that can make me a little bit nervous uh, sometimes because somebody's idea of harm and offence um, can be very very different to others um, as the recent Ofcom complaints about uh, diversities dance has shown you know just because lots of people find something offensive or complain to a regulator doesn't necessarily that it's mean that it's something that should be banned or restricted in terms of free speech and i think discretionary powers actually um, never tend to favor marginalized groups so it's something we need to be very wary of and um, that's probably it for me a crash course in media law i will share the links to the law commission review that i mentioned and also the Crown Prosecution Guidelines on prosecuting social media offences as well, if anyone wants to read more on those. Thank you very much, Holly. And as someone who conducts extensive public legal education myself, the challenge of taking legal provisions that are often worded in a way that's very technical, only for the elite Whitehall audience and, and lawyers can be very complex, especially where people haven't been given the skills and the tools through the education system to be able to comprehensively understand legal regimes. So that's very important work and thank you for all that you do. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to move on to Shay, who is the Chief Executive and Founder of Glitch UK, one of the organisations at the forefront of strengthening digital citizenship throughout the country. Shay and I met I think it was three or four years ago when we were both doing some work around encouraging people to participate in politics. At that stage, she was a, a councillor in Forest Gate. And I think for a while on her Twitter profile, she described herself as a recovering politician. <laughs> I'd like to think that she is now very much recovered as earlier today, she was giving a, an international talk at a Women in Tech Summit. And we're very happy that she was able to join us today. So I feel that Holly was talking very much around the debates that have characterized social media in, well, basically for the whole of the 2000s, you know, over the last 20 years. But Shay has done some fantastic work in this six month period that we've been living lives under lockdown on the effect, uh, looking specifically at women and girls that the lockdown has created in terms of risks to violence for them. So I'd very much like to give Shay the opportunity to talk through her recent work and the report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I remember when we met and what a lifetime ago that was. I mean, those issues that we were talking about were so pressing then. But, um, gosh, now they've multiplied now. Um, and just to follow on from Dr. Holly's doctor now, Dr. Holly's um, observation of the Netflix film. So I was quite eager to watch it with my um, boyfriend this week. Um, and we watched the trailer and it was really good. But I winced so much at how many white men were just in the trailer for it. And I was like, this is why, this is why we keep coming back to this unintended consequence of online abuse and gender-based violence online. And I want us to get to the point where hopefully in 2021, we stop calling online gender-based violence an unintended consequence. And we start understanding that it needs to be built into the very DNA algorithm of, of the companies, of the platforms and of its leadership and its staff team. And also how it works with um, uh, civil society too. So as, um, uh michael has said um we i'm going to be talking um specifically about our covid19 report so before lockdown um which i'm sure is difficult for a lot of people to remember um but we already knew that gender-based violence was a problem women were 27 times more likely to be harassed online than men and when you applied an intersectional lens black women were 84 percent more likely to be mentioned in problematic and abusive tweets 
And then when you start looking at how it's having an effect on the next generation of women and girls, engaging in both online and offline spaces, we saw that almost half of the girls that Plan International surveyed were already censoring themselves online because of fear of abuse and criticism. So this was already before lockdown. We already seen that government were not giving this the highest priority it should have been. We were seeing that this um, was always seen as a separate matter dealt with, um, to, be, to, to be dealt with separate from disinformation, uh, other hot online harms, cyberbullying, cyber scams, et cetera, et cetera. It was always seen as something that was different. I, I always find it um, hilarious when we now care about this information because it affects men and it affects democracy. But when it was women, it was called gossip. Um, and when it was uh, in the certain tabloid newspapers about prominent black women in entertainment and politics, it was called just um, what the media did. Um, but yeah, we've seen it was a huge problem. And then when we saw that we were now in lockdown and we were increasing our internet usage in which was reported by Ofcom, the, the drastic increase by Brits in using online spaces. This rang huge alarm bells for us around how the increase in internet risks would mean, sorry, the increase in internet, internet usage would mean the increase in risks. And what safeguarding and policies and processes are being put in place to make sure that everybody feels safe in this transition period. Because we all want to play our part. We all want to play a part. I don't want to catch COVID for nobody. I'm four times likely to die from COVID. So I don't know about you, but I'm very happy to stay indoors. But I also want to make sure that when we're staying indoors and I'm engaging in online spaces, that it's safe as well. And it's not as toxic as the offline space. Um, and so we launched a nationwide survey of over 484 people. Um, um, looking at the experience of women and non-binary people, it was very important that the heart of our research that we were intersectional as, as possible so we could capture the experiences that tend to not make mainstream news or aren't of celebrity status that, um, that are important for us to be aware of. Um, and that's how we know the tactics, as Holly was saying, that, that we can see the patterns and be able to kind of build a defense mechanism against it. And what we found from our survey is that almost half, so 46% of women surveyed said they experienced some form of online abuse during lockdown. And when you look at just black and minoritized women and people of color, that went up to 50%. What is also striking is that the majority of people also spot noted that uh, there's been an increase in the level of abuse they received in the last 12 months as well. What I think is damning and at the crux of what Glitch believes and a massive I told you so meme needs to be put there and like a, I'm watching Game of Thrones at the moment and that like the winter is coming. I want to be like Ned Stark and be like, I told you guys it's coming. Um, my boyfriend would be very happy about my Game of Thrones reference there. Um, uh, employers, only 9% of people who were surveyed, so they received some form of education, training and or advice around online safety from their employers. So it means that we made kitchen tables, living rooms, gardens, this uh, improvised remote working space all playing our part, but we didn't think about a digital health and safety strategy alongside making sure that our desk space is clear and that it's all aligned and we don't, we don't get problems with our backs and we've got all the infrastructure we need to be working at home. We didn't think about the online aspects of making people's living rooms, literally call centers and um, their places of work. And what the research also showed was that the most prominent places for the abuse was by no surprise was Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, Zoom, Google, and then it goes and so forth. And so we're seeing a spread of online abuse, but particularly on, on platforms that for a very long time, campaigners over a decade have been saying is not safe. Example with Zoom, campaigners have been talking about privacy concerns for a very long time before lockdown. And those loopholes or those, those gaps um, or those weaknesses were definitely pressed upon and used and abused by white supremacists and pranksters that caused quite a lot of harm. So we're recommending three key things. Everyone loves three key easy recommendations. The first one is really understanding what a public health approach to online abuse is and that being led by the government. Um, particularly as um, was mentioned before by previous panelists, panelists, Black Lives Matter 2020 has brought a renewal around how we do life and how we do and how we and how we govern and how we support the most marginalized and the conversation around defunding the police and looking at a public health approach to gangs as well was a high conversation last last year we are 
are not aware of you know evidence to show that did that the sending a troll to prison or to some kind of custodial sentencing and giving them a um a record is going to fix the glitch on the internet it's not going to address the problem so we need to think about a holistic approach we need to look at setting social norms we need to look at talking about online efficacy when we set that standard around a public health approach to our online communities it is then that we can start asking people and holding them to holding them to account that standard that we have set the second one is about money because all of this is great to talk about but if we don't have the money to back it we're just going to be here talking about it next year we need um huge investments from government and tech companies and employers around education around supporting their employees to stay safe around supporting wider societies to stay safe and around tech companies doing their part but at the moment we've got a new digital services tax which is taxing uh, tech, your, giant, your big giant tech companies and it's meant to generate something like 400 million pounds a year we're asking for 10 percent of that to be ring fenced towards efforts that will help end online abuse we've seen that tax generate 29 million pounds in one month in april 2020 imagine what 10 percent of that could do for civil societies who are on the ground stopping this um, being a blockade to this exodus of people leaving our online spaces because they don't feel safe having to think about career change i'll just say share one anecdote really quickly T -t tonight i am working later than uh, than normal i'm all about self-care but tonight i'm working later than normal why because I'm a, a group of under under 18 year olds who have by themselves um scripted directed filmed edited an amazing film um started to promote it last week and, and was under online and was on the rec receiving end of online abuse these are young 18 year old black women and girls who are trying to use art and as Holly was talking about freedom of expression to talk about what is going on in their communities and no longer want to go to the premiere, no longer want to talk about the film because of online abuse. That is the impact we are seeing on both online and offline spaces. And um, finally, it's all about all it's all on us to all play our part to help make the online spaces safe. We're calling on everybody to start thinking about seeing themselves as digital citizens, that we have rights and responsibilities online just as we do offline. And how we are responding to attacks, how we are res responding to our spaces being hijacked and weaponized and not being and not sleepwalking to what is the biggest crisis of, of 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shay, and that was very powerful. So I think over the three presentations that we've just heard, we have, in essence, heard some very fundamental challenges to the idea of the rule of law that Lord Bingham was positing in his book. We have heard quite extensively from Shay that in actuality, there are thousands of women and girls who are not able to receive access to justice to deal with issues ranging from traditional domestic violence to the online stuff and courts which are experiencing delays aren't able to deal with offenders etc are putting these women and girls at risk we've heard from holly about how in reality the provisions that govern social media law that the actions of young people are subject to are actually not very well known and thus may not probably meet the requirement that the law should be clear accessible and practicable and as arik said we have clear evidence that's quite consistent from a number of experiments that the facial recognition software that is currently at market does have a really disproportionate impact, stopping us from being able to say that at present, it does create equal outcomes and does serve equality before the law. So what I'd like to do now is to open up our attendees to ask questions hopefully not too probing via poll everywhere and over the next couple of minutes let's get as many interesting uh, contributions and questions as we can to see out the rest of our remaining 10 minutes i did say that there would be a break in the presentation so if people want to stretch their legs wherever they are in the world for a couple of minutes let's try and kick off again at 2 20 we've just lost a minute whilst I give that rambling <laughs> housekeeping comment. So let's wait a minute for some responses to come through on Poll Everywhere. And then hopefully we'll have some 
meaty conversation followed. Nothing as yet. Looking back at a few of the things which have come through before, people are talking about how they think the biggest threats to young people are sexualization, sexualized content. They have brought a concept that I, I think various thinkers, including Sonia Livingston, would challenge, which is about young people's obsession with the internet, which again, for me, is a bit of a, a conflation of uh, blame and cause there. Um, we had some comments looking at life. Life seemed to be the big contribution from several people. And yeah, it's a very difficult time to be a young person with uh, ever diminishing uh, prospects of being able to afford a home. The you know advent of university tuition fees over the last generation to a point now where you have to take out a student loan to be able to afford them. And again, the crippling impact of coming up in a, um, an economy that's going to see a slump due to coronavirus. All right, so our first contribution is, what do you think is the biggest challenge to protect your privacy online? So we'll start in a reverse order from the way the presentations were done and start with Shay and then Holly and then Arik. What is the biggest challenge to privacy online? FOMO. <laughs> I think it's the fear of missing out. And so I think we need to make data privacy sexier and more culturally relevant. Um, we, thanks to um, some pro bono work by an agency called um, Sonder and Tell, um, we, we were discussing just that last week about us not feeling, us not, us moving towards very academia, policy, wonk, nerdy language that isn't resonating with people. Like online gender-based yeah. violence does not. When people ask me, what do you do? Okay, I'm a CEO of a charity. Oh, what does your charity do? I have to say online bullying because people don't understand yeah. what gender-based violence really is. Um, where we try possible to stay relevant and current, we don't, but there's a balance, right? We don't want to dilute and diminish the impact online abuse has. At the same time, um, we don't want it to be just always negative and depressing. So it's about finding the balance of championing positive behaviours that we want to see. People who are embodying good digital self-care, muting, filtering, filtering and blocking and doing that with great energy and great confidence. People who are using um, TikTok for really good civic work and like online activism and at good allyship online and good online efficacy. I mean, I'm probably saying lots of key buzzwords here right now as well. At the same time, also trying to be careful of not um, uh, venturing into cancelling somebody, but using examples of where celebrities and role models have made mistakes. I remember last year when Lizzo, Chrissy Teigen and somebody else all in like the space of a week made some faux pas around data. Chrissy Teigen set, set, put, posted a screenshot of something and it had her mobile number in there and people would not stop phoning her. Um, then you had uh, Lizzo who I think everyone has had that when you're super hungry and the delivery driver or the Uber Eats driver, I mean, I'm not name dropping this, so uh, there's no like product placement here. I don't get any benefits from saying those two um, business names. Um, but you, we all know when you're like super hungry and the delivery driver doesn't know where you live is the wrong address or it's taking too long. You're like, are they walking or they, or what, how are they, why is it taking so long? Um, and Lizzo in the same position as a uh, lot of us, um, uh, screenshotted the the map of the delivery driver and, ha and their journey. She was a black woman. And it put her location and her livelihood and her and, and herself, her being at huge risk because Lizzo has millions of followers and um, they were able to find her and dox her. So it's about using those pop um, culture scenarios, incidences. We had it with Wiley, um, a grime artist who for a very long time, black communities had raised huge concerns about him doxing black women, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw him to just two months ago do the same thing to Jewish communities um, it's really about getting it's about getting this conversation into the mainstream using pop culture and language to make the behaviors more normal so that people don't get FOMO don't get FOMO of um, having to give their data like the face app like 
we heard about the face app stuff when everyone's making their faces old that it was a bit dodgy yet we did it all over again during lockdown um because we were bored and had nothing to do so i just think we just need to make it part of everyday um behaviors yeah, I think that answer is quite comprehensive. So I, I won't propose to have Holly and Arik give a viewers to those. We have heard had quite a few questions come through in, in the period that you were speaking, Shay. So I'll deal with the one which has come to the top of the list, which is should cyber literacy and online safety be part of the national curriculum in last year of primary and first year of secondary? So I think uh, all of us on the on the panel have been involved in some way in teaching some of these things in the school context and I definitely think that there should have been a binding basic curriculum subject ages ago on all of this as somebody who grew up in the period that the internet was taking off I would have really benefited from this and I know many of the young people that I work with would have as well the government have made an intervention in this area and from this academic year there will be a basic curriculum element of the sexual relationships and health education basic curriculum subject where young people have to be taught about a range of things including the law around social media and online abuse but for me it is a little too late and this should have been accompanied by resources for schools and funding for external speakers etc if this were to be something with the binding teeth that it needs we, we had a question around how can the government and big tech companies be enabled to exercise responsibility for cyber management. Holly or Rick, did one of you two want to answer this question? <laughs> Web roots? <laughs> uh, yeah, can you, can you repeat that? Sorry, that last bit. How can the government and big tech companies be enabled to exercise responsibility for cyber management? So I think there's one, kind of related to the previous question as well, I think there's one really big challenge in this whole discussion, which is around ambition and replicating the way we enforce the rule of law um, in the online space. So creating the rules is one thing and then enforcing it is, is, is another, right? So if you look at how we enforce health and safety standards on a fast food takeaway, you have things like standards, you have things like inspections, uh, and you have things like transparency reports. You'll go to the shop and at the front, it'll, it'll say their hygiene rating, for example. And should um, one of these shops fail to uphold the minimum standards after repeated warnings, you can eventually shut down uh, that institution. And when it comes, and you know, we have this for all sorts of things, you know, financial uh, fraud or failure to file accounts, uh, with company's house can also result in a, in a company being liquidated um, or shut down. And with the internet, you know, it's, it's, I, th I find it useful to think about what would it take for the government to ever say, we're going to shut down Facebook so you can't access it on your phone, right? You might say, uh, you know, a privacy breach of 10% you know, of UK users would result in that, or, or would it, right? Or maybe it's, uh, you know, plethora of child abuse images or the spread of disinformation. There's no clarity really on where that line is. And again, going back to what I was saying previously, there needs to be a kind of shift in the narrative on how willing we are to regulate the internet and uphold things like the rule of law and civility and respect. Uh, so that's, that's why I think the government should be moving towards right? proper, not really radical, but just replicating what we have in the offline world when it comes to the rule of law and trying to enforce that on uh, social media companies. Now, there's lots of limitations, one of which is uh, the fact that these are all US-based companies and we're trying to strike a US-UK trade agreement. This could be one thing that would get in the way of that. Um, but in terms of the tech companies themselves, I don't think, I think they have minimum uh, duties to ensure that they're uh, you know, their, their users aren't being abused in any way or exploited in any way. Uh, the market will play some role in that. For example, no one will want to use a platform where there's, um, you know, extremist content all over it or child uh, abuse images all over it. Um, but they, they should have their own expectations as well, minimum standards um, for how their platforms should be. But I, I strongly believe 
if we want democratic control, those standards have to come from the people through which the vehicle for which is the government. Uh, and I would veer very strongly away from self-regulation of these platforms, as I think, as I don't think it would actually make things better, and instead, you know, hoards expertise amongst these uh, few companies in Silicon Valley. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Arik. We have actually come to the end of our scheduled time, but with the consent of the other panelists and attendees, I'd like to go on for another additional 10 minutes so we can deal with a couple of the comments that have come through from Poll Everywhere. Are our panelists all right to stay? And I can do one more, I can, I, I, I can do one more question, but I, um, I have some filming to do. All right, so I'll try and clump together a couple. One of the contributions we had was, uh, this is some Apple strudel for us. Thank you for such a good presentation. What every, what every one of you said was inspiring to me as a sixth form student. What do you think young people can do to better ensure their online safety, which I think we've answered already. And something I don't think we've answered. Is there anything that young people should do which is different compared to online to, to older generations to, to stay safe online. Holly, do you want to have a go? And then Shay. I feel really strongly about young people having a very active voice in all of these issues. And actually, one of the reasons why I did my PhD research with young people is because I just think sometimes these policy and legal discussions and education discussions all happen, policing yeah. discussions happen up here, like over young people's heads. And we have had situations, you know, where judges are trying to rule on cases and they're like, what is Twitter? You know, so I think there's the things that I would say to young people is one, like make your voices heard, have conversations, you can educate older generations about these new technologies and how you feel about them and what you think is right just as much as you know uh, you know you can learn from older people we can learn from you is the first thing i would say um, and secondly i know everyone's very worried about online safety and online safety is very important but i would like us to broaden it out to talk about rights actually because safety is one aspect of your rights but there are lots of other aspects to your rights as well that are more than just um, safety, you know, privacy, freedom of expression, uh, right to a fair trial, freedom from discrimination, all these things. So, yeah, learn about your legal rights and pipe up and get involved in conversations uh, and open up those dialogues about the things that you want to talk about, because we want to hear from you. Yes, and on that point, Holly, we actually had a comment come through that did seek to make that distinction between privacy and safety, in which one contributor says, privacy provided by end-to-end -end encryption can create unsafe spaces. How can this be managed by the platforms that provide the services without compromising privacy? So you could think of a situation where a private channel was unsafe and vice versa. But I'm really not a fan of uh, everyone putting encryption as being the enemy here because encryption is a form of security, data security that is vital to us to be allowed to uh, enact our rights um, and things as well. Um, Arit, you're nodding. Do you want to jump in there? Yeah, encryp encryption is key. Right? We, we should definitely resist um, attempts to undermine that. Because you know, if you think about pre-internet, what is privacy, right? Privacy is the ability to, you know, to converse with others, to be yourself, um, you know, without, the, without any surveillance, right? So if you're in your own home having a conversation with a family member and no one's listening, that's basically, an, in many ways, an encrypted conversation, right? Your encryption is maybe your front door and the walls, uh, hopefully thick walls, right? Uh, if you get rid of that online, you don't, you can't replicate that private conversation uh, on the online space. And yeah, there are risks. Um, involved in you know the kind of content you see in things um, and maybe there are things that can be done to add clarity I know whatsapp for example uh, you can like click on a message to see how many times it's been forwarded without whatsapp necessarily knowing what is in the content of that message that maybe is something we can look at but we should never really get rid of the the concepts of having a private conversation Great stuff I think we're coming to the end of the, comment, the, the questions. There was, there was a comment, which is somewhat self-indulgent, but I'll, I'll read it out anyway. Michael, thank you for hosting this. <laughs> I like the start of it already. 
I underwent your online courses and it helped me a lot. And I really aspire to be able to do half of the work you've done. So <laughs> there was another question, which was around how do you address the larger crowds, especially if you consider that most of them do not know about the concept of data privacy? Will awareness programs help or do we, the people of law, need to do more as fellow citizens? So I think the answer is yes, both. There are some great efforts by lawyers and activists. I'm thinking particularly of Justice Week 2020, which was a campaign run by the Bar Council, Law Society and Chartered Institute of Legal Executives in England and Wales to promote the notion of public legal education in order to strengthen the rule of law. Again, I think that civil society does incredible work and the organisations represented on this call are all trying to advance people's understanding of the concepts that relate to having a world that's run by the rule of law in the digital age. And again, I think in terms of working at scale, efforts by the education authorities in the UK have not taken the scale and pace that I would have sought them to. Yeah, I feel that the insertion of social media law into the basic curriculum, which is something not just schools that are maintained by their local authority, but all schools have to compulsorily teach is a really positive development. So I think everyone on this call has a duty to make sure that their lay friends, colleagues, friends, lovers, etc., are more aware of these issues. As, as lawyers and people in politics, we have an awareness and ability to understand policy issues that I think should be related to others. We shouldn't sit on the knowledge in the confidence that it's locked within the ivory tower, but enable it to be shared more broadly for the benefit of others. And I think those of us who are able to should continue to encourage education authorities to create binding commitments and produce resources so that teachers who can and have the space to are able to work on these issues. So I think that actually comes to the end of the contributions that we've received through Poll Everywhere. Thank you so much for everyone who's been able to take part and participate and guide this conversation. The final thing I'd ask people to do is to rate the session from one to five with a very grumpy, red-faced, unhappy face being one and five being a smiling, beaming green face at the very far right. And it seems people are veering towards four and five, which is excellent. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who participated and not just the two who were able to stay until the end. <laughs> but thank you to Dr. Holly Powell-Jones, to Eric, to Catherine McGuinness and to Shay, both for being fantastic advocates for the rule of law and digital citizenship in their spaces, but also for taking the time to, to chat with me for an hour. For those who are interested in finding out more about our work, you can visit our website, binghamcentre.bickle.org, to find out about our work, not just in the rule of law and the digital age, but also in citizenship on Brexit and coronavirus. And we will have some very interesting conferences and events in the coming weeks and months. We'll make sure that everyone who attended the call gets a list of some of the reports and documents that panelists were discussing as the call progressed and we hope that those who had a few issues with poll everywhere or signing on were able to make it to the call so thank you to the city of london to all of our speakers to all of our attendees and to the civil shrine memorial trust for funding this work and we'll hopefully catch you all very soon all the best <laughs>